Okay, first I'm a bacteriologist, not a virologist, so I wasn't directly involved in the investigation of this outbreak. Uh, but as a microbiologist, I had an inside view of events. Um, I remember that uh, we were at the infectious disease round, which is held weekly on Fridays, and we were reviewing a patient that had a severe uh, community-acquired atypical pneumonia. And then our colleagues from Tan Tok Seng said that they had a very similar case. And what was more, a lot of the healthcare workers that, was looking, that were looking after this uh, patient had also fallen sick as well, which was very alarming. So at the same time, uh, there were some reports coming out of Vietnam and Hong Kong uh, of, of a very severe community acquired pneumonia that was actually causing deaths. And this eventually turned out to be SARS. During our discussion, uh, one of the uh, ID physicians suddenly recalled that an ID, uh, one of their colleagues who had been looking after the Tantau Sick patient uh, had actually gone overseas on conference and had reported uh, to be suffering from fever. Um, so there was, a, there was some debate as to whether this could have been caught from the patient and whether we should inform the Ministry of Health or not. So eventually we did inform the Ministry of Health and they informed the WHO and uh, in fact, the, I think the, either the very next day or the day after, as this uh, ID physician was travelling back to Singapore, uh, his, his plane was stopped at Frankfurt Airport and he was pulled off the plane with his family um, and he was uh, kept in Germany. And I think this uh, incident actually kick-started a lot of the SARS research because, because he was held in Germany, uh, the German scientists were able to isolate the virus and they eventually released the whole genome sequence of this virus and uh, I think uh, that, that opened the way for a lot of the subsequent work on SARS. Um, this little incident uh, I think had a significant impact on the control of SARS um, and I think it's a bit under-recognized by the international community. Um, I remember that night when I went home and I spoke to my wife about what I'd seen on the board. Uh, I said to her, something big is going to happen. Uh, but of course neither of us knew how significant and how big the impact of SARS was subsequently going to be. In fact, I think anyone that didn't live through SARS would find it uh, hard to appreciate what the fuss was about. Um, but it was real and people that were otherwise healthy um, died during the SARS. In fact, uh, two of our family friends and a work colleague uh, died of SARS. And we didn't even attend their funerals because at the time there was so much fear about cross transmission. Um, but at the same time, uh, during SARS, we could see that there was a lot of selflessness and courage being displayed by frontline uh, healthcare workers. So I think, on the whole, uh, Singapore did pretty well during the SARS outbreak. Okay, when we first uh, heard about each one and one, coming out of Mexico, the initial reports were pretty alarming because uh, there were a number of deaths being reported. Uh, because we had recently been scarred by the SARS experience, we, we, were gonna, we, we essentially treated it like SARS again, except that possibly we were thinking it would be even more transmissible. Um, but with the benefit of hindsight, we probably overreacted. And the first hint I got of this was uh, when, when each one had one uh, hit the United States and Japan. Initially, they were like us, they were treating it like a repeat of SARS. But after, after the first wave of H1N1 hit these two countries, they started reporting that actually the illnesses were quite mild and uh, it probably wasn't worthwhile or possibly wasn't even, it wasn't even possible to control H1N1. Um, but uh, I think we, we took a bit of time to react to that, so we, we actually kept the extraordinary sort of SARS control measures on for probably longer than we needed to. Um, in fact, I myself came down with H1N1 during the outbreak and I can say it was a relatively mild illness. Most of my uh, research has been uh, with uh, antimicrobial resistance of, of bacteria and I think the main utility of this research has brought uh, awareness of the problem in Singapore. Um, I think it, um, 
one of the, the obvious things that's come up from the research is that Singapore is very vulnerable to importing antibiotic resistant bacteria from other countries. And that's because we are a medical hub and we are a transport hub. I think it would be very useful to um, set aside funds specifically for infectious disease or microbiology research because um, when there's no outbreak happening, people tend to forget how important infectious diseases are. The other thing is that now we are promoting academic medicine, uh, we can encourage and uh, support trainees that have uh, the, the, correct, the right aptitude to do research. I think on the whole, our research base in this area is still a bit narrow because the universities have tended to focus on viro virology and immunology. And there are probably existing gaps in bacterial pathogenesis. Um, and in the future, we will need microbiologists that also have expertise in bioinformatics. Well, I'm going to stick to the theme of antimicrobial resistance. Um, I think some people may say that that problem has already arrived, but I think on the whole, we are still seeing a lot of colonization rather than infection. And I think there will be a lot of difference if we find that our transplant units or our uh, ICUs have 60% of the infections being untreatable. So we're not at that stage yet. So I think uh, for now, to prepare for this, uh, you probably need to improve surveillance. Um, you need, we need to find ways of uh, identifying and typing bacteria more rapidly. And uh, we probably need to bolster infection control as well. Um, infection control is a bit of a Cinderella subject. Uh, so we've got to try and uh, make it something as glamorous as oncology or ophthalmology. Um, I think there also need to be more formal links between the human, animal and environmental um, health organisations. Because as you can see, a lot of the recent outbreaks have actually been linked to animals. I think uh, infectious disease and microbiology is a subject that, um, that affects almost every medical specialty. Uh, but it's always easy to forget about it uh, because it, um, it, uh, I guess patients don't usually have a chronic infectious disease. So it's not like hypertension ischemic heart disease is not going to be with you all the time, so it comes and it goes. And therefore maybe it doesn't attract as much attention as it should. Um, so when there's no big viral outbreak happening, you know, people forget about it. Um, so I think it's something that, that, that people need to be aware of all the time. Because as you can see, um, the only things that have brought this country to a standstill from the medical point of view are big infectious disease outbreaks. Um, you know, ophthalmology and oncology are important subjects, but they, they don't affect the economy in the same very direct way. I think the only way to kind of sell uh, antimicrobial resistance as a problem to the public um, is to increase awareness in the same way that you have documentaries on um, whales uh, on TV. Um, so it's just to, to, to sort of uh, bring it into the consciousness of the general population and maybe as a subject in the secondary schools so that everybody has a certain baseline knowledge.